That sounds wonderful to me. Hello. Hey everybody, thanks for coming. We're going to be starting here around 2 o'clock. It should be a really good time giving a lecture to give you a little bit of information on magnet fishing and all about it. So thank you guys for coming. Yeah. <laughs> Probably one of the funniest things. <laughs> Church is it's a little metal toy ship. Yes. It was uh, by the harbor, and I can only imagine that it came off of the same boat that would be the large boat. That same spot. So many of them. This summer I played on Jack Summit to have a lot of I'll go take a look. <laughs> There's a texture down there. <laughs> 
I just got some video clips playing from all the police interactions we've had over the last couple of years. This day in particular, we had pulled a pipe bomb out of the river in Ypsilanti, and the bombs were going to come out and destroy it for us. And as you guys come through later to look at the finds, feel free to grab stickers and poker chips. They'll be up in the front here for you. Not the whole, but I brought, I brought a bag over here. Can I get a light for it? Can I get some lights and a siren? Can I get a light for it? Can I get some lights and a siren? They'll sometimes do it for me. <laughs> Yeah, not here, here. <laughs> 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 
Hey everybody, we'll be getting started right around 2 o'clock Eastern time, so thank you guys for coming. Yeah, it's our school. Yeah. <laughs> 
2020, I was watching a magnet fishing video on YouTube because the pandemic had just started and the better thing to do is just watch a bunch of YouTube videos. So I was just scrolling and scrolling through videos and this video popped up where a guy was throwing a magnet into the river and he had pulled out a grenade and I thought it was the craziest thing. The cops had came and I instantly knew that that was something that I wanted to do and take part in. And I think for like a solid two months after that, I was just binge watching everyone's videos. So as soon as I learned that that might be something that I would want to do and try, I hopped straight over to Amazon and I bought my own magnet fishing kit. Now, what comes in a magnet fishing kit is you know, a magnet. It's usually a new medium magnet, and they can be quite strong. The one that I'm currently using is a 3,800 pound magnet. I can pull 3,800 pounds, which is absolutely insane when you think about it. That's in like the most perfect condition. So I bought my first magnet fishing kit, and it arrived, and I lived in Carroll, Michigan. It's a little rural town in Michigan, and I went up to one of the only spots that there is to throw a magnet into a river where there's access, and I was finding all kinds of stuff, like screwdrivers and tools and a lot of fishing lures. I was getting really into it. And then on the first day that I was there, I had decided that I was just going to record everything that I was doing, everything that I was finding, because who knows, maybe I can start my own channel and be great and have something how these people work. Welcome to episode one of the Michigan Manual Man. I'm here in Carroll, Michigan today, located down by the Carroll River, the Cass River here. So that's how it all began. Um, and since then, it has just continued to boom. Today. 
So you got a little bit of backstory on how I got into magnet fishing. I'll dive in a little bit deeper. So at the beginning of the pandemic, I really was bored. There wasn't a whole lot to do and I didn't want to be around people. So I figured being outside and on the outdoors would be a great option to kill my free time pretty much. So I started watching a lot of YouTube videos and I, like I said, I didn't have much time. And I, I saw this video of a guy called Daniel Bowen. He had pulled up a grenade and that just instantly, my eyes went, oh, you know, it's, it's not something that you would think about seeing pulled out of a river. And it really got me curious to see what else was down into the rivers. So for the next two months, I'd spend 10 hours a day watching magnet fishing videos on YouTube. And it got to the point where I, I wanted to do that. I needed to do that. When I first started getting into magnet fishing, I didn't know where to start. There wasn't really a whole lot of people in the community that were willing to help and talk to me, essentially, because I hadn't, I didn't have a YouTube channel. I hadn't done this before. And over time, I found that, like you've seen, there's a huge community out there that are willing to help. So even after today, if you guys have any questions ever, feel free to reach out to me and I will answer within 24 hours always. That's very important to me, just because I didn't have that when I started. Now today we're gonna to go over some of the equipment that I use out on the river. Um, a lot of the different techniques that I use. We'll go over some of my favorite finds that I've got. Uh, we'll have you guys come up and I'll show you some of the cooler stuff that we found over the years. And like I said, we'll go into some of the styles on how I go to find the locations I look at. Because when I first started, I didn't understand that there was a method to the madness. So we're gonna go ahead and start off with some of the equipment that I use. <laughs> So when I first started magnet fishing, there was only two kinds of magnets at the time, a single-sided magnet and a double-sided magnet. A single-sided magnet looks like this. It's got an eye bolt on one side and it's best used for dipping off of like docks and stuff straight down because if you're pulling it from the side, it's just gonna get caught up in there. So I started off with a single-sided magnet that was 720 pounds. From there, there are double-sided magnets. This is an example of a double-sided magnet. So both sides of this magnet are magnetized. This is a smaller magnet, but you will still find some stuff with this. Over the years, I wasn't finding a whole lot with these magnets, and I was meeting up with a lot of other communities and a lot of other magnet fishers across the country who were using bigger magnets. And at first, I thought I was gonna be okay with a 720-pound magnet. It seemed real strong to me, at least but a lot of these other people were using magnets that were 3,800 pounds, and I was just like, okay. So I decided that I was gonna purchase my first ever clamp magnet. So a few years later, this style magnet came out. This is called a clamp magnet, and it holds a large neodymium magnet in here. Um, the clamp magnets are good for doing dipping and dragging as well, and it's got a little bit of a different shape, so it's got a much more secure spot here to grab on when you're pulling. After that, the 360 magnet came out. This is what, it's a little, this one's in rough shape because I brought to show you what happens to magnets over time when throwing them into the rivers. But this magnet is designed to be magnetized all the way around. These are the best magnets for going out on the rivers and finding things. Like, um, compared to the double-sided and the single-sided, you're gonna find at least 80% more things with this magnet than you would with those other magnets. The next thing that you're gonna need is a strong rope. We use climbing ropes. Um, typically, you want the tensile strength of your climbing rope to be about double the strength of your magnet. That way, if you get stuck out in the waterways, which happens quite frequently, you can get your magnet back. And that's another thing that you're gonna wanna have is a good pair of gloves. I've been stabbed and prodded just about everywhere magnet fishing so far, and these have saved me a lot of trouble. These are my winter gloves that I use. They're a little bit thicker and they're waterproof. They're by a company called GNF. If you got any questions about that afterward, these are great for magnet fishing in the winter. The next piece of equipment that we use is a come along. So this is a four ton come along. What this is used for is when you get your magnet stuck out in the waterways, it'll get caught up in rocks or you'll be stuck on something large like a vehicle or anything that's got a lot of strength to it. And with this, we can pull this part out here, hook it up to our rope and crank it back out. And that's, that way you don't leave a magnet behind. Now there have been times where this didn't work. <laughs> uh, we were magnet fishing one time in Hoboken, New Jersey, and her magnet had got caught up in the rocks and on the Hudson. And we cranked and we cranked and her rope actually snapped. Now there's a few reasons that can happen. So it was a little bit of an older rope. It had been being used for quite a while. So it's not gonna be as strong as a newer and fresher rope. 
Um, and the tensile strength you want to make sure, like I said, is double. You risk snapping your magnet, uh, your rope. A few weekends ago, we were magnet fishing in Detroit, and I got my magnet stuck. And we hooked it up to the back of a vehicle, a truck, to remove it. And my rope snapped and came and hit me in the hand. So you need to be very careful when you are using these because those ropes, when they snap, they are very dangerous. They, you, potentially life-threatening if you get hit just in the right spot. So you want to make sure you're very careful using that as well. The next thing we always bring with us is a five-gallon bucket. When I first started magnet fishing, I had no way to move my rope around or take it home in a safe manner or a clean manner. And over the years, I had tried uh, just wrapping it up and like I would a normal rope and rolling it up and hanging it up someplace to dry. I had tried different electrical outlet reels so I could reel my ropes in. What I find best is that a five gallon bucket is just fine. You can get them cheap down at Home Depot or Lowe's. The way I do it is I like to put them in and you can just coil it so that way when you get to the bridge, you can take your magnet and just throw it out and you don't have to worry about untangling everything. Because I find that I would get a lot of knots beforehand when I was doing that. After securing it. Yes, yeah, so you want to secure it as well. So that's another big thing. Uh, you want to make sure your magnet is secured to something that's strong and sturdy. You do not want to connect the magnet to your person. There's been instances in the past of uh, where people had the ropes around their waist, and here comes a tree trunk floating down the river that their magnet gets stuck on, and they get pulled into the river. It's very dangerous. So you never want that magnet connected to anything other than a railing or a tree off to the side, never on your person. Uh, the next part, we're going to go into a little bit about how I find these locations and where I go. So when I first started doing this, I was in Tuscola County, which is not too far from here, on the Cass River. Now, there are a lot of different things in the Cass River, but you're not going to find a lot of those big ticket items that you're looking for, like the guns and things like that, in smaller towns for the most part, from my experience. The big inner cities are going to have a lot more trash. We spend a lot of time in Detroit. Flint, Saginaw, areas like that, that have a higher population where there's going to be a lot more stuff in the rivers. Now, when I first started going, I would just travel to any bridge willy-nilly and not quite understand. I would just be hopeful, you know? And it got to the point where I was like, okay, I'm doing something wrong. I'm not finding these things. And that is when I met one of my best friends, Jason, from the Motor City Magnet Fishers, and he was down in the Detroit area. So you can... Just even by thinking about Detroit, you know that there's a lot more crime in that area. So I started going with him down there, and he kind of taught me the ropes on how to go and find these places that have good things. Now, some of the things that I look for personally when I'm looking for spots are places that have um, payday advances, Dollar Generals, dollar stores. We also utilize crime maps. So any city that is in existence has a crime map online. If you just Google crime map in that city, you can pull that up through the images, and it'll show you exactly where the worst parts around that river are going to be located. And that is the main reason we started finding so much more, was because we were utilizing these maps. Um, some of the other things, we're going to go over some of the finds that we've got. So the, there's things that you're going to find a lot more than everything else. And one of the first things that is are fishing lures. I know probably a lot of you like to go out fishing. This is actually a pretty good way to go get a lot of lures. <laughs> There's been times where we've pulled in a ton of fishing line that had hundreds and hundreds of lures coming off of them. In the fish, if you're magnet fishing, sometimes uh, people that are fishing near you can get a little upset that you're tossing a magnet in. But I promise you, if you walk over there with a bundle of fishing lures, that'll make them happy and they'll leave them up. <laughs> Some of the other things that we find a lot of are Railroad spikes. Um, just about every bridge I've ever magnet fished has at least a few railroad spikes. And there's a lot of really cool things you can do with these. People take these, and this summer I plan on forging a lot of these into knives, and they look really freaking cool. <laughs> um, some of the other things that we find quite often, not that, where'd it go? Bullets. Not all bullets are magnetic. The steel core ones are. We find a lot of these. A lot of people say it's not possible to find a, a bullet magnet fishing. And we find quite a bit of them with our magnets. <clears throat> uh, where was I at? Oh, yeah. Horseshoes are another big ticket item that we find. Um, I found probably 30 or 40 of these. I always get really excited about these. And it's kind of funny because when you first start, you're going to get a lot more excited about a lot of these items that we find. And as the time goes on, you kind of get desensitized to it a little bit. Like the guns in particular. 
we find a lot of firearms. My group has pulled in over 120 in the last three years. Now there is a procedure that you need to be following when you're finding things like this. Uh, you need to be contacting the police because it, you never know what that gun could have been used for. And if it's in the river, it's in there for a reason. Now if it's older and rustier, like this here, this is a Colt uh, revolver that was from 1872 that Scuba Sonia just pulled up two weekends ago in Lansing. Anything old and historic, you're okay to keep. Anything new that could be fired, you want to be using the non-emergency lines to call. There's been instances when we were in Flint and Detroit where you call 911 because some police officers will tell you to call 911. But in those instances, you're tying up the phone lines and it's you're, you're taking away benefits that could help other people that really need the help. <clears throat> so make sure you're using the, uh, the non-emergency line. Things like knives, we find those quite frequently too. They're not quite interested in the knives. So don't worry about those. We throw all those in the trash. And that is the next thing that I would like to talk about is how to properly dispose of things. There's a huge issue in the magnet fishing community where people will just leave their trash behind. They'll find all of this stuff and they'll leave it on the sidewalk for other people to deal with. Us, we personally make sure that every single item that we find is taken with us and disposed of in trash cans, dumpsters, or is taken to the scrapyard. There's been instances where we found enough magnet fishing stuff as a group to buy 10 pizzas for our crew just from the metal that we found that day. So you wanna make sure you're properly disposing and not ruining it for anyone else. Now because of that, there are some states that have enacted laws against magnet fishing, like South Carolina. Although the, uh, the main reason is for the historic items in the water there, they're afraid that you're gonna damage them and by pulling them out, to me, they'll never see the light of day if somebody doesn't. But um, people are leaving things out and over time, if people keep doing that, this hobby that we enjoy so much is gonna become illegal in a lot of areas without permitting. <laughs> Some of the other weird things that we have found, we find a lot of voodoo ritual um, objects. I've got some of those here to show you. A lot of little tiny tools, like this little anvil. And these are all located inside of this cauldron. We have found five cauldrons since we started doing this, and I think those are probably some of my favorite things that we find. My all-time favorite find, I've got two, and I brought them both for you guys today. This is a metal ship that was pulled out of the Detroit River down in Detroit. And where this is located, it used to be a harbor, and now it is not. Um, I was told that this is the exact replica of a ship that had been in that dock at that dock, which I thought was really freaking cool. My other favorite friend, I'm going to this one. <clears throat> this here is a one-way bridge sign. And what is so unique about this what is so unique about this is the reflectors in this sign are actually uranium glass. And I don't know if you guys know about uranium glass, but it literally contains uranium, and under black light, it will glow. Wow. So you can see it lit up here. Wow. When I found this, I had no idea what I was looking at. It was so corroded that you couldn't see anything. <laughs> That's even better. Oh I took it and I cleaned it up really well, and. Somebody had come and said, hey, you should put black light on that and see what's on there. So I bought myself a black light, and sure enough, it was uranium class. I think my favorite, other favorite part about this sign was the bridge that it came from was torn down in the 1950s in Cairo, Michigan. I was able to find a photo of the 1930s with this exact sign in the photo from before it was taken down. And that, that was one of my favorites. Another one of our favorites, and probably the most valuable thing we have pulled out of the river, is this 1913 porcelain license plate. We have found three of these so far in the Lansing area, as well as one 1914. Uh, we've got these, we've had offers for $750 a piece on these ones. And I think it's one of the most beautiful things that I've pulled up. You wouldn't expect that the patina and everything would last from where the porcelain was, but it has over time. <clears throat> Another piece of history that I really love is this postal telegraph. You can see it better on this side. So back when Western Union and telegraphs were a huge thing, this is from the Lansing area, this would have belonged to a delivery boy's bicycle. <laughs> so this would have gone up underneath the railing for the guy to go deliver it. 
Um, I thought that was really freaking cool when we found that. I've also found a Western Union one in the same area, and these date back to the early 1900s. This is another one that would have gone on to a bicycle. <clears throat> okay, we'll take a little break and ask if anyone's got any questions about anything. What is the cost of purchasing the magnets? So the cost of buying a magnet can range quite a bit. If you get onto Amazon, you will see that there are a lot of different options on Amazon. And the Amazon magnets will usually range anywhere from $30 to $50. Now, once you start, so look, for instance, this magnet here <clears throat> is a magnet that would cost around $30 to $50. Your pull strengths are going to be around 750 pounds to about 1,500 pounds, depending on what you're purchasing. Um, the next step up are going to be these clamp magnets. These are a little bit more pricey. Now, these can cost anywhere from $100 to $200, depending on the company that you're buying them from. Uh, so it's a little bit more pricey. The 360 magnets, these ones, these can range anywhere from $200 to $350, depending on where you're going through. I represent a company called Kratos Magnetics. Um, they produce all kinds of really nice magnets, the 360 magnets particularly. Um, I've got a discount code if you want to talk to me after that will get you a 20% or a 15% sorry discount um, off of your total purchase. That is the, the biggest cost when it comes to magnet fishing. Everything else going out is quite affordable. But one issue with these magnets is neodymium is what these are made of, and it's a very soft metal. Now, this magnet has been used and abused, and it's been thrown off rocks and all kinds of stuff. And as you can see, it has cracked out almost completely out of its casing useless now. It still works, but most of the magnetivity is gone. It's not as not nearly as strong as it used to be. But I would still throw it if I was in a pinch. <laughs> Next question. Okay, well, first of all, you did answer the one. We need one of those <laughs> for when it gets stuck. Yes. And second of all, I, you know, it's his hobby, but when I try, okay, so I throw it. But when I'm pulling it in, it's like every bridge is reinforced with metal, or a dock is reinforced with metal. How? It, every time it'll pull up, and then it gets stuck on the side. Yes. And then I have to leverage it off because it's not going anywhere. Mm -hmm. So how do I get it out of the water without getting it stuck and... You know what I'm saying? Yeah, so one of the main things when you're looking for spots, there's a lot of seawalls like you're talking about that are located just about on every spot that accesses the water. Yes. You really need to make sure that you are leaning over quite far to get that magnet. I almost, sometimes I'll have to pull it straight up and away from me to avoid, especially with my 360, to avoid sticking to that. Right. Um, we also have a crowbar that we bring with us just about everywhere because those magnets, when they get stuck, they get stuck. Right. It could be a pain to get them off. Uh -huh. Um, so with that, with that crowbar, you should be able to pop it, but uh -huh. even if the magnet, once you get it far enough up, you can reach down with the crowbar and stick it to the crowbar, and that way you can pull it up uh -huh. and over without having to worry as much about it getting stuck to the side. Uh -huh. that, but that is a huge issue, is getting magnets stuck, especially in areas with seawalls. It's ginormous. <laughs> yes. It can be a enormous problem. <laughs> yes. Okay. I'm a pro at getting stuck. <laughs> yes. <laughs> Yay, I don't feel so bad. You are not alone. <laughs> do you ever get any feedback on if any of the guns have been used in a crime? So when we do report these to the police, they do give us a document number, a case number on each firearm that is turned in. Typically, if it's anything more than just a, a robbery or something that got stolen from somebody, they don't let us know. So if they were involved in a murder or involved in some serious crime, they don't typically tell us. Uh, we have had several come back stolen. I do have a friend in Wisconsin who magnet fishes, and he's had one come up. It was an AR-15 that he had found, and it was connected to a double homicide. So that's the only time that I've heard where one was actually used in a crime. You have to be careful when you're pulling up weapons that they could fire. Yes. So just like a, any firearm, you want to treat it as it's loaded at all times. Uh, you want to be pointing that away out to the water where there's nobody in the way because that gun could fire. The potential for it to fire is very small, but you never want to take that risk. 
Another big thing we have found uh, world of mortar from World War II and pipe bombs. The pipe bombs still had dry powder inside, so those could still explode. Um, when you pull things in like the explosives, you want to make sure you're not pulling it off of your magnet. You want to leave it on the magnet and call the police from there and they'll take care of that part. But as far as safety goes, when you are pulling up guns, you want to make sure that you are maintaining it, being pointed in a safe direction. That way you don't have to worry about it accidentally firing and hurting somebody. So do they ever let, return the guns to you if they don't have That is a great question. So in most um, counties and states, it goes by local ordinance. So down in Detroit, Macomb County is the only county in Michigan that I know of that will personally return the firearm to you if it comes back stolen. We try uh, in a lot of other places. In New Jersey, uh, for instance, their gun laws are a lot more strict than they are here in Michigan. There is zero chance you're gonna get that weapon back, ever. <laughs> But in, in some places in Michigan, it's all up to local ordinance. So if you keep calling and calling and calling on the case, sometimes there'll be a way for you to get them back. Because like the one antique pistol you have there, those are collectors that you really would like to have. Yes. So anything that's older than, let's say, 1960 or so that is rusty, like something like this, this is from the late 1800s. This is never going to fire again. It doesn't have anything. In, like, you know what I'm saying? These are okay to take. But anything that looks like it could be newer, looks like it could shoot still, you want to make sure you're calling the police for that. That's very important that you do. Um, if you get caught with those, there's definitely some repercussions of having a potential murder weapon on your body. In river fishing, the problem is you put the line in where you want to fish, and the river just takes it. Um, just, um, so you have to let it go far as you do with them, try to pull it back in. So you were the fish is how do you deal with the river current? The current where we fish is quite strong down in the Detroit River where we fish a lot. You want to throw the magnet far left to where they're up river essentially so when it's coming down it settles down. And then the biggest way to avoid it is to pull on angles. Before I would always just pull it straight back to me wherever I was standing. But if the current is really strong, if I pull it on an angle and I walk with it, I'm able to cover ground and my magnet will stay along the bottom. And that, that, that's one of the only ways that you're gonna get it to stay down there unless you've got something like a weight that you could use on your rope as well. But those currents are a huge issue. There's been times where we'll go to, like for instance, in Vassar, I was went, going to throw on the cast river there and the current was so strong that even after I threw my magnet in, it just floated, <laughs> it just kept going and it would never touch the bottom. So pulling on an angle will really help get rid of that issue. <clears throat> So do you ever go in a boat? So I have magnet fish from a boat and from a kayak. My personal experience, it is very difficult compared to fishing from shore. Simply, especially in the kayak, you catch on to anything heavy, you're gonna have to kayak over to the side and pull it up from there because I've seen people pull them up in tip. For instance, my buddy Danny Dip was doing that and he has tipped before. <laughs> um, from the boat in particular, it's hard without having something like a pontoon boat. We were on a fishing boat so we were constantly bumping up the outside of the boat, and the person that boat it was was never happy. <laughs> yes. He didn't enjoy coming. <laughs> Any other questions? I would maybe add on, in terms of getting stuck, having a place to go to get it unstuck by just pulling on it. So if you find a bridge, a lot of times we'll make sure that there's a place on the bottom, on the bank, that we can go so don't get too stuck, because then we can kind of go down, walk around, and in the other direction. That is, yes. When you do get stuck, there are other ways to get it unstuck. Um, for instance, like she just said, if you pull it to the left or pull it super far right, a lot of the times you can get them to unwedge. One of the other big issues we've had is getting our magnets stuck up under the bridges. And one way that we call it the, the Dulo method, my buddy he created it, you want to take something heavy, for instance, like this anchor. And you could take it to the rope about 10 foot up from where you would have it hooked up to. And you can take that weight and drop it straight down. And what that's going to do, it's going to put the force pulling down rather than pulling the magnet up. And it'll pull the magnet right back down into the water and you'll be able to get it back. We've had to do that quite a bit in the past. <clears throat> Recently, I was in Lansing and in the bridge, there's a crack about yay big. And my magnet made it about eight foot up into this crack. There was no other spot to pull from and it would have been impossible to get out without dropping that weight down. And it pulled it right out. <clears throat> 
People are throwing guns in the rivers for nefarious reasons. Yes. What has been their reaction to your hobby? Ah, that's a very good question. <laughs> there, if you are posting these on social media, you're going to get backlash. Um, I've had death threats. I've had people tell me they're tracking me. I, I've had some serious threats against me for pulling these out because the people that are throwing these into the rivers, they are not happy that we're pulling them out. But the way I look at it is, if that gun was connected to a serious crime where somebody's family member was involved, I'd rather them know exactly that there's justice brought for finding these than have to worry about that as much. There are things, uh, we make sure that we aren't telling anyone our locations where we're going for the most part, unless we're meeting up with friends. Um, yeah, it can be a very difficult thing to deal with. Um, it's, it's, especially if you're posting on social media, it can get pretty bad. Yeah. Don't fish alone. Yes, the, the places that we do fish in are very high in crime and typically somebody will be carrying with us when we're there. So we have a little bit of safety. You always want to fish in a group. Don't ever go out alone. I've done it in some dangerous spots and I've had people approach me and it's a very uncomfortable thing. And we make sure that we leave as soon as that happens because it can be quite dangerous. Are all the cops in the communities receptive? As far as the police departments go, we've had a lot of really good interactions. The, the police genuinely seem interested in what we're doing. Um, and they, they, I've had instances where they want to throw a magnet with us, and they've stayed out there with us for an hour, hour and a half, tossing magnets with us. Some, some people that I know that do this, they've had hit or miss. Uh, for instance, my buddy Outdoors Weekly, he was fishing down in Georgia by a military base, and he found like 60 or 70 explosives in the river. And he actually was given ticket, he was ticketed, three separate tickets, and was, had to go to court because of it, which they were all dropped in court. But it's a lot of the police officers, they, they don't like the paperwork, which I can understand. They don't, they don't enjoy that part. And it feel, some of them feel like we're taking away from the resources from the public. The way I look at it is, I'm part of that public, and if I need something, I should be able to call for help as well. <clears throat> but it's really hit or miss, depending on where you're at. I've had nothing but good experiences. When it comes to that too, you pretty much, you get, you get what you give. If you are respectful and nice and talking that way, you won't have any issues when it comes to calling the police and turning these in. Yes. Um, years ago, a car was found in the Saginaw River with a body in it. Wow. So if you snag a car, what do you do? So typically if you were to snag onto something that big, um, you, wouldn't, you wouldn't right away know it was a vehicle. Um, you, when you pull the magnet out, you would feel it slide a little bit um, on the, the hood or the, the top. And that's when the come along would come into play. If you get stuck to it, you'd have to come along it off. If you do find vehicles in the waterways, you do want to contact the local authorities. A lot of the times they'll bring out cranes and they'll come out and they'll actually pull them right out and tow them out. Um, like you said, there could be bodies in them. So you want to make sure you're reporting those as well. There's even been instances where we found um, like just ditched cars out in the woods where we've been fishing at, and if it's got a, a VIN number on it still, or if it's been ripped off, we might want to report that as well. It looked like in your video you had a camera on one of them that you threw in there. Is yes. that something you normally do, or how does that work? So occasionally we will take a GoPro and we will connect it to our ropes. So uh, my buddy had a live feed going from that, so when he threw it, he could literally see on his little screen everything that was in the water as he pulls it up. And that's not something we do a lot, uh, especially because he's lost two cameras now doing, <laughs> doing just that. There was one time where he threw it in and it hit a uh, giant chunk of ice in the Detroit River and it just busted his camera right off and long gone. <laughs> but it, it is cool to see down there. Um, in Eaton Rapids, Michigan, we had located a snowmobile. We weren't able to pull it up, but she had dropped her camera down and we were actually able to see what was down there that we kept getting caught on. So those cameras can be pretty cool. Yes. Okay, so you scuba dive? Do you sometimes go down? Stand up. Come over. <laughs> <laughs> Do you sometimes go down when, when they're um, doing that to see what's down there? No, because usually the water that we're fishing in is very dirty and dark. I prefer warm and clear waters when I dive, but a lot of the times, like the Detroit River, they don't recommend you even go dive there because the current's so strong. Oh. Um, the likelihood of you getting hurt is high. So I haven't dove there, it's also probably very cold. Um, but yeah, for the most part, I don't dive for magnet fishing finds. I probably should, maybe when we head down to Florida for, or, or something like that, we might try it. 
but for now we have it. And if you like magnet signals, go ahead. I was going to say, I, I assume that a lot of these places, like Saginaw River and uh, big city rivers, that this ability is so low, you can't see more than a couple feet. That's if that. Yeah. Okay. And then you mentioned that you don't publicize where you're going and stuff like that. And I was going to ask you if, uh, if you had a schedule that just go out and watch people do it. So we do host events quite often, uh, at least once or twice a year. Um, next month or yeah, July. So the third weekend of July, we're going to be hosting a cleanup on the Red Cedar River in East Lansing, Michigan. Um, and those are the opportunities where people can come out and meet and learn some more about magnet fishing, actually get their hands on a magnet. We've been hosting an event in Detroit called the Get the Motor City Magnet Fishing Event, where each year, this past year, we were able to raise over $3,000 to purchase magnet fishing kits that we donated out to local youth. And we had over 150, was it 150 people came? Oh, yeah, it was we, over 100 for sure. Yeah, we were able to donate out 50, 50 magnet fishing kits out to kids to come out and learn about cleaning up the environment. Now, there is a huge environmental aspect to this too. When we first started, for me at least, it was all about finding cool stuff. And it really was about that at first. But now, a lot of the time, we're worried about the environment as well because we're finding a lot of the electric rental scooters in the water and batteries and just things like plastic connected to metal that aren't good for the environment or good for the habitats that are down there. And by pulling those things up, especially the batteries, you're really creating a healthier environment for the animals that live in that area. <clears throat> For anybody who does scuba dive, it's really important to clean, keep the waters clean. I don't know if you guys know about our reefs, but they've been bleached out. There's so much pollution. So cleaning it up is really important for us, not just for magnet fishing, but for diving as well. Another big thing is the fishing line. There's so much tangled fish line, hundreds and hundreds of miles of tangled fishing line on pretty much every shore where people fish are at. And getting that up out of the water, you're not only helping the wildlife, you're also helping the people that are fishing out in those areas, not loose lures. And they really appreciate that. <clears throat> What's the farthest you've been to just two of this y'all? <laughs> um, we've gone all the way over Sacramento, California. We've done a lot of fishing over there. She's from New Jersey, so we spent a lot of time in the New Jersey and New York City area magnet fishing. Um, but we've fished in Pennsylvania, Ohio, Indiana, pretty much anywhere where I can drive to will magnet fish. Now we go out almost every weekend, either on a Saturday or a Sunday. And these videos that I'm putting out there, they're, they'll be five to ten minutes long, but what you don't see behind that is we're spending 12 hours out on the river to find those five to ten minutes worth of video. A lot of people think that they're going to go out there for an hour or two because it's such a short video and they're going to find all those things. You really do have to be patient because it takes a while to find stuff. But it's totally worth it when you get it. 100 percent. It's one of the best ways that I've found to go spend time with friends and family. I've even had my parents out there with me. My dad's throwing a magnet with us. and. He really enjoyed it as well. <laughs> Damon, not so much. <laughs> Is there a difference between equipment you use in salt water and fresh waters, and does it have a particular effect? Same equipment. Um, the only difference between fishing in salt water and fresh water is going to be how you clean your magnet after the fact. Um, in fresh water, you don't have to worry about cleaning it as much. You're going to get a little bit of rust and corrosion no matter what. But with salt water, that salt in the water is really going to do a wear and tear to that magnet. So you're going to want to make sure you're rinsing that off in fresh water after you're done magnet fishing in salt water before you put it away. Now some people will go ahead and they'll clean their whole, all their equipment every time they fish. Though I, I'm pretty bad about that, to be honest. I, I will pull it out after I'm done, I'll wrap it up, and I'll call it good till next time. But my magnets definitely last. Um, Typically, a, a magnet, if you're using it every weekend, will last you anywhere from six months to a year. I've gone through, I think, probably 15 magnets by this point. Um, so it, it's something that you are going to have to replace over time if you're using it a lot. Be careful not to throw it at cement or any of the hard surfaces around the bridges. It does happen. They will crack. Very They're fast. very fragile. Yes. <laughs> Do not put your hands between a magnet or a chair. I will stick two magnets together to show you guys how strong these magnets are. Let's see, we'll set one. You pulled these off the corner here, didn't you? For instance, this is a 360 magnet. This has got a pull strength of 3,800 pounds. This magnet can pull up 2,400 pounds. And we're probably not going to be able to get these apart. <laughs> oh, oh, especially now. Sure now. <laughs> 
But when you get a magnet stuck like this to another magnet, it does happen. And the best way to go about that is we'll tie one rope off to a post, and then we'll take the come along to the other side, and we'll be able to crank them apart. If that doesn't work, good luck. Especially with newer magnets, it can get very, very hard to pull them across. If there's some corrosion on it, or there's any like dust or anything in between, it'll help out. Sorry, my hand back there. I was gonna say, is there anywhere um, that you guys want to go? Like, you guys have plenty of trips around different waterways now? So uh, we do plan a little bit when it comes to like our vacations and stuff. Like for instance, we went to Pennsylvania and we wanted to get some magnet fishing in. So we were looking for Airbnbs that were located near the riverways. Um, there are places like Cincinnati that I'd like to get to, and I'd love to get down to Florida. We've got some friends down in Florida that do it quite a bit. Um, but pretty much anywhere there's water, it doesn't matter if it's a pond, a creek, a river, wherever there's water, you're gonna find at least some stuff in the water there. Are you gonna take a magnet table? I would like to take a mega tan table. I don't. I don't find anything. I don't think we're allowed to. Yeah, don't fly with magnets. They'll probably take it away. There is a way that you can package your magnets with styrofoam. I do believe it's got to be like eight inches thick all the way around every part of your magnet before you can fly with it. But you have to check those in as well. I don't recommend it. <laughs> Any other questions? So with the length of rope, how do you know how? So when I first started, I was using a 65-foot rope, and that, that is enough for if you're just magnet fishing in a smaller area. I now utilize a 100-foot rope, and I find that that works best if you're fishing for bridges and stuff. It gives you that little bit of extra leeway, because when you're on the bridge, your trajectory, you're able to throw it a little bit farther than you would from the shore because it's coming down, um, and that extra 40 feet of rope actually makes a huge difference. So I'd recommend at least a 100-foot of rope uh, if you're fishing off bridges. Yeah. And if you get stuck, it gives you a little bit more leeway to pull to a different tree to come along or anything like that. Sometimes if you get too far, we've had times where we've had to hook multiple ropes up to each other to pull and get our magnets back. Do you prefer fishing upstream or downstream on the bridge? Um, it, it actually doesn't matter all that much. It's more, do I like fishing on the far side, which far side am I gonna fish? What I find is a lot of the material will come down and swirl up and be located on the far left or far right sides of the bridges. In the middle where the current's a little bit stronger, it's pulling more of the stuff. And you gotta think the current underneath when it comes to the sides or hitting rocks and stuff, and it's starting to swirl. And you'll find like spots where I'll be throwing on the right side of the bridge and not find a thing. I'll come over here in every single throw and the far side, I'll find stuff every throw. I just thought of something in the video you had like a three-way hook or something what what was that about you great like? question so if they're if you're in a throwing well if you are magnet fishing in an area that doesn't have a lot of rocks or anything that you can tell from throwing your magnet out so much we utilize a grappling hook and now this is going to help you grab onto things that are not as magnetic like a bicycle for instance can be pretty hard to pull up with a magnet because not a lot of it is magnetic so the, the, comp or the grappling hook will grab onto anything that's not magnetic and pull that up. That's really helpful for fishing line as well as bicycles and things of those nature. So how did you pull the bottles up? So that's my next thing. So along with magnet fishing, you'll find yourself, if you like this hobby, there's other hobbies uh, like mudlarking, metal detecting. So mudlarking is another hobby that we enjoy where we will go walk creeks looking for old bottles, looking for just People's trash, which is our treasure. Um, the, these bottles were found in Flint, Michigan. We were looking for a magnet fishing spot, and I drove the wrong way, took the wrong turn, and there was a little bridge, and I said, you know what, I'm gonna get out, I'm gonna go look, let's see what we got. And I looked over here, I said, hey, there's glass over there. And we had found an old bottle dump from the 1950s, where back in the day, all of our trash was burned, and it was put into giant piles on corners of properties, or it was dumped farther away, typically by a cemetery in the creek. And so we really enjoy going and looking for bottles and things of that nature too. Um, there's a place in Brooklyn, New York that we like to go to called Dead Horse Bay. And it was a dump from the 30s to the 60s. It's located right on the ocean shore for about a half a mile. And every single day, new bottles are getting released from the trash pile where the wall, uh, the wall is being corroded away. And we'll find all kinds of bottles in that area. All the way back to the 1800s. <coughs> Yep. 
there are no more questions, you guys are free to come up and I can show you what's up here and talk a little bit about each of my finds. Uh, there's also poker chips up here for you, as well as stickers. Feel free to take as many as you guys like. And I appreciate every single person coming out here today. It's been a lot of fun. If you have any other questions ever, feel free to reach out to me at themichigamagnetman at gmail.com. And like I said, I'll respond within 24 hours to any questions. <clears throat> Thank you so much for watching today. It's been a blast. If you have any questions, feel free to comment and I'll make sure to get back to you guys. Thank you.